Good morning. Our call to worship is John 8, verses 31 and 32. To the Jews who have believed in Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Amen. Mary Lynn is not with us today. She's gone to a wedding, so she's having a fun day, and good for her. Grace and peace to you from God our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit, who welcomes you to today's worship service. In the way of announcements, today is the Midwestern Association Spring Celebration. It's going to be held at Listowell. Registration starts at 2. So therefore, you'll see Dan and Shannon and Nancy and I leaving shortly after church because we have to drive to Listowell. So uh, if anybody else wants to come, please let us know. I remember uh, when I was first coming here, Fred Gilbert used to have a van, and he would insist the van had to be full before he would leave to go to spring celebration. And, uh, anyway, uh, just a little side note. April the 29th, Conference of Canadian Baptist Women of Ontario and Quebec at Highland Baptist Church in Kitchener, and please register online. Congregational business meeting is April the 30th, Please have your reports sent to me by April the 19th, which is this Wednesday. So if you can please have your reports in. I've got a few in already, which is very good, and I look forward to getting the rest of them. We have a couple of other announcements. Um, Messiah is going to be performed on Georgie Shores United Church in Owen Sound, Saturday, May 13th, at 20, uh, 2023 at 730 PM. So I'll put that on the bulletin board downstairs. Our anniversary Sunday is going to be the first Sunday in May. And the torchmen are going to be here. They're a quartet. And we uh, invite you to invite someone to come with you. And uh, um, they sing all over southern Ontario. So. Um, and uh, our guest speaker is going to be Reverend Rum Rumley, is that the right pronunciation? Thank you. Um, who is someone that Mark knows. So um, I invite you to uh, invite friends for that and cook something for the potluck, please. We'll have a potluck afterwards. This time I'd like to leave you in a prayer of invocation. Father, we love and praise you. Jesus, we love and praise you. Holy Spirit, we love and praise you. We pray asking you, our blessed Trinity, to fill this sanctuary with your peace. Fill our hearts, minds, and bodies with your peace. You who are almighty, open our minds to hear and implement today's message. Bless Pastor Shannon as she delivers the message entitled, Compelled to Tell the Truth. Loosen our tongues to follow the great commission that says, Go and tell, not sit in a pew and wait for them to come in. We need to sing and proclaim that our God reigns. This is the story we have to tell to the nations and that our God says, so I send you by grace made strong. He will make us strong as we go. In our responsive reading, we see how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news. That is us, folks. We are here to bring the good news of God's love and grace, and the Lord will get, make you strong as you bring that news to Wyerton and area. Father, we pray with the Holy Spirit guiding us and we will joyfully bring the message that you have designated for us to bring with joy and gladness. We ask that you make us a praying church so we can be fruitful. Hear us now in silent personal prayer.
Father, thank you for the opportunity to communicate with you through prayer. What a blessed assurance we have that you listen to our prayers and answer anything that is according to your will. Hear the songs we sing. May they be sweet, a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. Look into our hearts and see the joy of the increased faith as we build day after day as we study and follow your word. Gracious Lord, enfold us in your mercy and love as we express our love to you. Father, we worship and adore you, bringing glory, honor, and praise to you, our Redeemer, our King of Kings. Bless the service and us to your use. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Our first song this morning is number 372, Our God Reigns. We ask you to stand if you are able. faithfulness to us day after day. This offering is but a small token given from thankful heart for how you have blessed us. Multiply it for use. We pray this in the name of our Savior, Jesus. Amen. Responsive reading is Isaiah 52, verses 7 through 10. How beautiful on the mountains Who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings. Who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, the word of God reigns. Listen, you watchmen, lift up your voices. Together they shout for joy. When the Lord returns to Zion, they will see it with their own eyes. Burst into songs of joy together, you ruins of Jerusalem. The Lord will lay bare his holy arm in the sight of all nations. And all the ends of the earth will see the salvation of our God. Amen. Amen. You did such a good job, job the last time. We're going to let you sing again. Number 446. We're going to ver sing verse 1, 2, and 4. So we, once again, we ask you to stand as you're ready. Number 446, 1, 2, and 4.
the last verse. We've a Well, good morning, everyone. It's with a little trepidation I uh, deliver this seniors moment, but I hope you'll see the point to it. Uh, <laughs> truth, two truths and a lie, apparently is supposed to be a great party game, and can also be a good icebreaker in meetings, at classes, or other situa situations where you need to make introductions. So this morning I'm going to try it out. I'm going to read three statements at a time, and you have to decide which two are true and which one is, is the lie. All right? Here we go. Number one, as a kid, I loved going to school. Number two, I skipped grade six. Number three, I was the first one in my family to graduate from university. Where's the lie? I love going to school. That's the one. <laughs> you are right, Cindy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, exactly. It's okay once you get there, but anyway, good, good one. So yeah, I did not like going to school. Get away from your sister. <laughs> the second grouping I have, number one, my favorite doll was Thumbelina. Number two, my favorite color is pink. And number three, my favorite books to read in high school were Agatha Christie books. Where's the line? Two. Two. <laughs> right, you're right. My color, my pink is not my favorite color. <laughs> Number three. I got my driver's license on the first attempt. I have never received a speeding ticket. I have never changed a flat tire. Hmm. Number two, I've never received a speaking ticket. <laughs> no, and, 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 uh... She's never been caught. <laughs> Sharon might say something about that, but, uh, no, I have never received a speeding ticket. So, um, that is true. I got a warning one time, <laughs> but I never received a ticket. <laughs> so, where's the lie? Number one, I got my driver's license on the first attempt. Nope. Because I was a farm kid, I drove tractors all the time. So the lie is that I have changed a flat tire. <laughs> I said I never changed a flat tire. Okay, now nah, number four. So I've got two more stats here. So the next one is chocolate cake was the first thing I ever baked. I took 4-H when I was growing up, and I loved making jello for our kids. Where's the lie? Number three. Yeah, number right. three. I cannot make jello to save myself. I can't do it. I hate it. Maybe that's why, but yeah, the jello, that's the lie. Man. 
can't handle it. Uh, last set. My first car was a Ford Mustang. My dad taught me how to hotwire a car, and I once hit a duck with my car. <laughs> so where's the lie? Yeah, you're right. Dad refused to show me how to hotwire a car. I asked him, but he refused. <laughs> so yes, I did hit a duck with my car at one point, and it was just like hitting a pillow. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> and yes, uh, anyway. So on this subject, I want to read a devotional entitled entitled Words of Truth or Lying Lips. And it's written by Joel, and I meant to ask Bob how to say this, um, John Kind, it's a Dutch name apparently, um, and he's from Meaford. And he wrote, from Proverbs 12, 17, 19, and 22 we read, he who speaks truth declares righteousness, but a false witness deceit. The truthful lip shall be established forever, but a lying tongue is but for a moment. Lying lips are an abomination to the Lord, but those who deal truthfully are his delight. And Joel goes on to write, during the occupation of the Netherlands from 1940 to 1945, a lot of people listened to Radio Orange, a Dutch radio program aired by the BBC European Service on behalf of the Dutch government in exile in London. The programs were typically 15 minutes long, and Joel says that my parents always listened, as did many people in the Netherlands. It was the only way to get the truth as to what was going on with the war. On May 13, 1943, all radios were confiscated by the occupying forces, but Dad did not turn in his radio. We had a big workshop at the back of our property, and that is where he hid the radio. In the evening, he would go and listen to the broadcast from London. If he had been caught, he would have been killed. One person in our area was betrayed by a neighbor uh, and was taken away and was never seen or heard from again. During that time, false information was told by the occupiers to make things look better than they actually were. The same thing is happening now in Russia, so we're told. We certainly believe that what we are told here is the truth, for we can see every day on television the atrocities being inflicted on the people of Ukraine. Yet apparently the people in Russia are being told a completely different story. False propaganda and lies. This is nothing new. The same thing happened when Jesus was taken for trial to Pilate by those who despised him. Luke 23 reads, And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this fellow perverting the nation and forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ a king. Then Pilate asked him, saying, Are you king of the Jews? He answered him and said, it, it, it is as you say. So Pilate said to the chief priests and the crowd, I find no fault in this man. But they were the more fierce, saying, He stirs up people, teaching throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee to this place. Pilate openly declared that he could find no fault in Jesus, as much as admitting that he believed Jesus to be telling the truth and the chief priests to be lying. We know that Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior of the world, and all the lies told by the authorities could not change that. Because of lies and false accusations, Jesus died on the cross for the sins of the whole world and was buried but rose from the grave on the third day and ascended into heaven where he rules with God the Father. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. He is the truth. And we can count on the truth to prevail. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, Jesus and Holy Spirit, you are the way, the truth, and you are life. You are full of grace and truth. Thank you for 
pouring your love into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us who trust you. Forgive us for speaking lies, for they are an abomination to you. Forgive us for believing the lies of Satan, our accuser. For your forgiveness is complete and forever. Your love restores us and gives us hope. Help us to distinguish between truth and lies. Remind us to turn to your word for clarification. May we be known for speaking and abiding by your truth. To your honor and glory, in Jesus' name we pray. Um, I, appreciated, I appreciated it this morning. Um, Kathy came to me with a concern, and uh, we just sort of prayed together in the room there at the back, the prayer room. So please feel free to use that. Um, please feel free to um, see myself or, or Bob or any of the deacons before service or after service if you have a prayer concern. But to, together today, now as a congregation, let us go to God in prayer. Holy God, we come before you in prayer, lifting up to you the joys and concerns, our hopes and dreams, knowing that you alone hear us and answer us. Father, we thank you for the privilege of coming before you, our creator and redeemer. We thank you for the peace we know through faith in Jesus. We thank you for everything you provide for us, for we know that every good and perfect gift issues from your hand. Almighty God, we ask for your forgiveness for the many ways we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. Forgive us for our anxiety and our fear, for it reveals our lack of trust in you, God. Forgive us for those things we have done and left undone that do not reflect your holy standards. In these next few moments, God, hear us as we bring to you our personal confessions. Merciful Father, we praise you for the kindnesses you have shown us, even in this past week, for safety in our homes and on the road, for work you give us and for the good works you have prepared for us. You know how uplifting it is when we are able to help others. Keep us from missing opportunities to serve you by meeting the needs of one another, this community, and our missionary fields here and around the world. Gracious God, we thank you for the jobs we have and the ones that we have had that serve to support us. We pray that you would keep people safe as they work and as they commute. Help people find work and find joy in their jobs. We ask for your blessing and protection upon medical and emergency staff, upon tradespeople, upon retail staff, upon farmers, upon public employees, and all who labor. May they be encouraged, and may they find encouragement in what they do. Most importantly, Lord, we ask that you would turn the hearts of your people to you, for members of our families, for our friends and neighbors, for our visitor that we had this morning, for our enemies, for members of our country and nations worldwide, we ask God that you would gift them with faith in Jesus as their Savior and risen Redeemer. That you would let them hear your message of salvation and understand. That you would help them to see you in the world around them. That your kingdom would come. We thank you for new grand and great-grandchildren in the Chen and Vanden Heuvel, Ryan, Jance, 
Longland and Stewart families. Uphold and strengthen the parents as they care for their children. And Lord, grant them wisdom in all they do. Bless those children that they would know and trust you, Father. Knowing that our lives are in your hands, God, we bring before you our petitions for healing and help for each one of us here, for our family members, and for those who have joined us in prayer. Grant our physicians and nurses wisdom and compassion in treating the needs of your people. Heal us from what ails us, that we may glorify your name. We pray for Lorne, Bonnie, Grace, <coughs> Mary Lou, Faye, Gladys, Irene, Marion, Rosemary, Tanya, Liv, Chris, Doug, Roberta, Tanya. For Bob and his family, for Marilyn Stewart and her family, for Tanya Couch and her family, for Karen Kidd and her family, for the Longlands, for Roger, and for all who grieve the loss of loved ones. Lord, we ask for your comfort and reassurance as they mourn. For all who mourn, may they know your presence, God. For Sam and Sharon, Lord, we ask for your peace and comfort and that you would bless the time they have left together. For our world that is at war in Ukraine, in Israel and Palestine, in Sudan and all over the continents, for death at the hands of violence and crimes, for attacks that reveal racism and hate. Lord, we pray for justice and repentance, for an infusion of your heart and healing. Father, in your mercy, release those who are trapped in their addictions. Help them find hope and healing in you Help them to find the strength to shake their dependencies upon drugs and alcohol and whatever else may be harmful to them. Thank you for touching our lives. May we also be open to your voice in our lives that we may see with new eyes and hear with new ears the direction you will have us to go. Guide us as our association meets later today. May our churches grow and flourish in your love and grace for the purposes to which you have called us. We pray all this in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. May you be blessed in the hearing of God's word as it is taken from the 28th chapter of Matthew, verses 5 to 20. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, he is risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, he has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. While the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. When the chief priests had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money. 
telling them, you are to say, his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. If this report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always, to the very end of the age. Amen. How good are you at following instructions? Have you ever bought a toy for your kids that came with the ominous warning, some assembly required? Years after the fact, my mom told us kids how it took her into the wee hours of the morning one Christmas day to assemble a tabletop hockey game for us? Or have you ever purchased a piece of furniture, perhaps a piece of Swedish furniture, that comes in a few flat boxes that require assembly? <coughs> How good are you at following those instructions? Or is it a matter of when everything else fails, you read the instructions. To bridge any language barriers, I love how the Swedish furniture company uses pictures to explain the process. After you have purchased the product from them, they show you what tools you need, including your need for a building buddy, and then they go through the steps of construction. If you have a problem, you know who to call. Today's scripture gives us a set of instructions that compels us to tell the truth, God's truth about Jesus. The question is, how good are you and I at doing what we're told? Does your compliance to instructions depend upon who is telling you to do something? Does your compliance to instructions depend upon the value you attach to the work? Well, this morning we have instructions from the one who gives us life and breath. The one who purchased our freedom and victory over darkness and death. We have been left instructions by the one who loves us and heals us. The one who covers us in robes of righteousness when we believe in him as our risen redeemer. Our grateful respect for and our sense of awe for God's grace and mercy which he extends to us should be drivers and motivators for us as his glad and ready builders of his kingdom through discipleship. We cannot and must not contain and limit Easter's message, message to just one Sunday. It is the basis of our hope and should compel us to follow Jesus' clear instruction to tell his truth and make disciples of the nations. Throughout the account of Jesus' death and resurrection, there are a whole lot of examples of people telling other people what to do and what not to do. Pilate 
tells the religious authorities, you have a guard of soldiers. Go make the tomb as secure as you can. They did what they were told by the governor and one, the one in authority and sealed the stone. The two Marys, the women, go to see the tomb and experience an earthquake, an angelic visitor, and they receive a set of instructions to go quickly and tell the disciples that Jesus has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. All of this is observed by the guards. The women do what they are told, afraid, yet filled with joy. Afraid, yet filled with joy with the news told to them by an angel, a messenger of God, on the authority of God, to tell the disciples what to do. And if that wasn't convincing enough, suddenly, Jesus met them saying, Greetings, hail, rejoice. Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. This is the first time our Lord called his disciples by this endearing name. They no doubt thought that their Lord would reproach them with their past cowardice and infidelity. But in speaking this way, calling the disciples his brothers, his brethren, Jesus gives them and us a full assurance in the most tender terms that all that was past and was buried forever. I love how the women's joy that overtook them when they saw the risen Messiah. We know they were afraid. The Bible tells us that. But because they were filled with joy, it was that joy that took precedence. That joy that bubbled up to the top when they suddenly saw Jesus before them. They did not give voice to the many, many questions that must have been swirling around in their heads. Instead, when they saw Jesus, they came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Jesus himself told them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. So the women do what they are told. They follow Jesus' instructions and go to tell the disciples the amazing news of Jesus' resurrection. The Bible tells us that while the women were on their way to tell the disciples the joyous news of Jesus raised from the dead, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. So if they reported everything that had happened, they too were witnesses to Jesus' truth. After the chief priests and elders met, they devised a plan whereby they gave the soldiers a large sum of money telling them, you are to say his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. The religious authorities vowed to keep them out of trouble if this report of their supposed negligence of duty and Jesus' resurrection got to the governor's ears. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. However, because of the compelling nature of what they had witnessed and perhaps their lack of respect for the chief priests and elders, we have this statement in scripture that reveals someone could not withhold the truth. For the Bible states this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. The fact that we have this record of the attempted cover-up by the religious authorities shows just how foolish they were. If it is true that the guards were asleep, they could not know that it was his disciples that stole the body of Jesus. 
To believe this cover-up, we have to believe all the soldiers were asleep. All of them. We have to believe that all the soldiers violated the strict law of the Roman military against sleeping on the watch, which was punishable by death. We have to believe that all the soldiers slept so deeply that none of them were awakened by the work and exertion and noise necessary to roll away the stone and carry out the body. Their plan to attempt to cover up the truth of Jesus' resurrection reveals what Bible commentator Adam Clark calls a whole heap of absurdities. Absurdities that the scheming parties would have to commit to memory in order to keep their stories straight. However, as I love this quote from Abraham Lincoln, no man has a good enough memory to be a successful liar. This story alleging that the disciples stole Jesus' body means that firstly we're supposed to believe that the disciples, mostly fishermen, were able to overpower battle-hardened Roman soldiers if they hadn't fall, all fallen asleep. Secondly, as we've already seen, the disciples had fled for their lives when Jesus was arrested. So how would they have mustered enough nerve to steal his body away from a heavily guarded and sealed tomb? Thirdly, after Jesus' death, the disciples were hiding in fear for their lives because of the Jewish leaders behind closed doors. So why would they do that if they already had Jesus' body? Fourthly, why would the disciples willingly die, which they did, for a so-called lie that Jesus had risen from the dead. The fact that we have a biblical record of this planned conspiracy attests to the reality that someone did not do as they were instructed. Someone leaked the details of the scheme devised by the religious authorities of the day. Someone broke rank and did not do what they were told. Because if everyone in the guard had done what they were told, if they kept quiet about the earthquake, the rolled stone, and the angel, if they had instead spread the grave robbing story, how do we explain the end of the 15th verse, 15th verse that states, so they took the money and did as they were taught? And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. When are we going to learn that God will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of the heart? As Jesus' disciples, we need to put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. For nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. <clears throat> Just as Jesus knew of Judas's betrayal, and tried to prepare his disciples for his death and resurrection, so too would the attempts of chief priests and elders be revealed and uncovered. Some member of the guard did not do as he was told. The religious authority of the day, the authority of the day, the bribe money, the allegiance to the Roman governor could not suppress the truth of God and compelled a soldier or some soldiers to reveal what had actually happened at the tomb of Christ. Witnesses to this wonder confirmed God's compelling truth. Jesus has risen just as he said. 
Lord willing, in the coming weeks, we will study the appearances Jesus makes in and around Jerusalem, as mentioned in the book of John. Matthew does not tell us about Jesus' appearances to his disciples in and around Jerusalem, as John does, because Matthew seems interested in showing that the promise of Jesus in the 26th chapter was fulfilled. And in that text, Jesus predicts the disciples' abandonment, Peter's denial, and states that after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. The disciples wisely heed the women's message as told them by Jesus. For the Bible tells us, then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. Now this mountain may have been the mountain near Capernaum on which Jesus taught what we know as the Sermon on the Mount. Mount Aramos, close to Tagba and ancient Capernaum on the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee. And just as Luke records that the women, when they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven disciples and to all the others. Scholars surmise that word spread of Jesus' appointment with his disciples on the mountain where Jesus had told them to go, and that some 500 disciples, and of course those would be counted male disciples, had congregated on that mount as recorded by Paul in his first letter to the Corinthians, where he writes that Jesus appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the time. The location of the instructions, a mountaintop underscores the importance of obeying the instructions. Mountains in Matthew's Gospel are places where Jesus' authoritative teaching and divine identity are revealed. They include the mountain in the temptation where Jesus rejects false authority. The mountain which Jesus teaches, is, teaches with authority. The mountain on which the feeding of the 4,000 occurs and the mountain of the transfiguration. The divine Son of God, the way, the truth, and the life, obeyed the Father and spoke what he heard from the Father. The angel at the tomb confirmed what Jesus had done and issued instructions to the women. The women, in turn, delivered the news of Jesus' resurrection to the disciples, and those same witnesses, as inspired by God, recorded this testament so that generations past and to come would be trained in righteousness. They heeded God's instruction and were obedient and faithful in their witness of his compelling truth. And now it's our turn. In this closing scene from Matthew's Gospel, we are clearly told by not just a trusted source. We are told by the trusted source. By Jesus, the suffering servant himself, we're told what to do. The Holy One of Israel, the Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, the King of Kings, the one to whom all authority in heaven and on earth has been given, tells us, tells you and tells me, to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. This is not a suggestion. Jesus, the risen king, issues an authoritative command to his disciples 
that encompasses all authority, all nations, in all things, for all ways. And the beauty is, is that doing what Jesus tells us to does not require us to have a perfect past. When we hear that the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go, it reminds us of Judas's betrayal. That there used to be 12 disciples. As was mentioned before, Peter denied knowing Jesus three times, and they all abandoned Jesus when he was arrested. They were hiding behind closed doors. It is to these less than perfect disciples that Jesus gives the responsibility and authority to make disciples of all nations. It is clear we don't have to be perfect to have perfect pasts in order to introduce others to Jesus either, to teach them and train them up. As well, it is clear from this passage that even now, with the risen Savior before their eyes, doing what Jesus tells us to do does not mean we have to be without doubt. At this incredible juncture, possibly surrounded by hundreds of people overlooking the Sea of Galilee, the Bible records when they saw him, when they saw Jesus risen from the dead after dying on a cross, they worshipped him. But some doubted. Whether it all seemed too good to be true to some, or whether others were hanging on to lingering shame from having forsaken Jesus during his suffering, God's word states, that some doubted. Even then, some doubted. And yet Jesus entrusts authority to imperfect and doubting disciples like these and to disciples like you and me. Jesus commands us to make disciples, to talk to and spend time with unbelievers and new believers in order to make disciples. We know that Jesus' disciples were a work in progress. In Matthew's Gospel, Jesus defines them as ones of little faith. And faith the size of a grain of mustard seed is all they need, and it is enough. Faith the size of a grain of mustard seed is all you and I need. It is enough. American author and motivational speaker Zig Ziglar is known for saying, it's not where you start, but where you finish that counts. Jesus' disciples get there eventually, if not immediately. The witness of the rest of the New Testament shows us the disciples preaching, teaching, healing, and sacrificing their lives when necessary. Jesus' commission to make disciples of all nations comes with the assurance that he will be with them, that he will be with us to the end of the age. Doing what Jesus tells us to means taking action right here, right now. Clearly, we are to do what Jesus tells us to do. The goal of the Christian church is to make disciples for Jesus Christ, for the transformation of the world. The message of this closing scene in Matthew is that any and all believers in Jesus as the risen Redeemer are called to make disciples any and everywhere, with no excuses, no postponements of justice, and no obstacles that God can't do something about. Jesus said, go, seek, 
disciple, baptize, and teach to some very imperfect disciples. To Peter, the rash and headstrong, Jesus said, go and make disciples. To James and John, who sometimes wanted to call fire down from heaven to destroy those who did not welcome Jesus, our Savior. To them, he said, go and make disciples of all nations. To Thomas, who must put his finger into the print of the nails, or he would not believe Jesus. To him and disciples like him, Jesus, the Son of God, says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. To you and me in our many imperfections, Jesus says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. May God bless our efforts as we are compelled to tell his truth and make disciples of all nations. Let us pray. Lord of heaven, around whom the hosts sing, we praise you and thank you for entrusting us with grains of faith. Impress upon us the privilege it is to share your heart, to care for others so much that we want them to know you. Give us the words to explain the hope we have within us so that you would work through us to make disciples of all nations. To your honor and glory, Father, Son, and Spirit, we pray. Amen. Please stand as you are able to sing our final hymn, So Send I You.
God the Father bless you. God the Son defend you. God the Spirit keep you now and forevermore. Amen.